is actually to tell you a story. Uh, and it's a story that I hope will resonate with all of you. And possibly it's a familiar story until perhaps we get towards the end. So once upon a time, we lived in a world where there were two major things. One was called family. And the family was, as you know it, there were adults, there were children. And the adults did many things and so did the children. But one of the things that they did together was to get ready and send the children to school every day. The other thing in this world was something called a school. What was a school? It was usually a building. It had rooms, it had walls. And when the children came to school, they were sorted by age and sent into different groups. And these groups were called classes. For each class, there was another adult, an adult who was usually called a teacher. And she led the children to the day in a number of activities, usually called lessons. The children and the teacher used books. Each of these groups had a separate book and they were expected to know what was inside the book. There was a bell that indicated that you could now shift from one book to the next. And at the end of the day, there was another bell that enabled you to go home. And at the end of some months or end of the year, the children usually did something called a test or an exam. And then following that, they moved into the next class. So this is the way the world worked. And over a period of time across the world, many, many children and soon most children were going to this thing called the school. Now, as we are listening to the story, this seems like quite an ideal situation and familiar with all of us. But even at that time, if you looked a little bit closely, particularly a little bit closely at schools and children in countries like India, you would see that uh, while schooling was going very well, in terms of what the children were doing in school, there was still quite a lot to be done. If you looked at what we call the annual status of education report, and let's say you looked in at one of these groups, let's call it class five, even as late as 2018, you could see that in class five, there were some children who were doing very well. Almost 50% of the children, half the children after five years of school, were able to read quite fluently and do basic arithmetic. But there was a lot of children, rest of the uh, half, that were having some difficulty. Broadly speaking, across India, especially in rural India, even in class five, there was about a little under 20% children who were still struggling with reading uh, letters uh, and small words, even in their own language. There was another 20% who were able to maybe read a couple of lines, but would struggle if you gave them a big story. And if you looked at math, then imagine a problem like 56 minus 37. Uh, there were still half the children after five years of school who would struggle to be able to solve a problem like that. I think people were increasingly becoming aware that this was an issue, that schooling was proceeding well, but learning needed some work. And uh, you know whether it was in the family or whether it was in the school, we were all stuck trying to balance the needs of these different children. And how do we square it away with the aspirations that we all had for individual academic excellence for these kids? But broadly, if we step back, the family felt that its main responsibility was to send children to school. And that this business of learning would really be carried out within the walls of the books, uh, within the walls of the school and within whatever it is that the teachers and children did together. And that's kind of where we were. And then suddenly to this world came a huge big shock. And that shock was like everything suddenly overnight changed. The thing that we called school had to shut immediately. The rooms were shut, the doors were shut, the gate was shut, and the children were sent back home. And this went on for a week, two weeks, a month, two months. And now 10 months later, we are still in a situation where we are really not sure what's going to happen. And over this period of time, when everything came to a standstill, and particularly when the schools shut, it was like a giant grand tree had fallen. And we are not sure when that tree will get back up again. 
So what happened after this big shock hit us? I think to begin with, everybody was still just stunned with the shock and we didn't know what to do. But slowly many things began to happen. And if you look closely at a village in India or perhaps a village or a community anywhere in the world, you could see that everybody started doing things in somewhat new ways. Inside the family, parents began to help children. And we saw that even in villages in India, where perhaps parents were not very well educated, they were still helping their own children out in different ways. Uh, if you looked at what friends and siblings did, friends and siblings did what they always did. They taught each other what they knew, and they together tried to make the best of this very strange time. What about teachers? I think teachers were very taken aback because they really didn't know how to work, excepting when they had children in front of them. And uh, you know, the, now the children weren't there. So teachers worked out different ways of reaching children. And the ways of reaching may vary from the very rich schools to the much poorer schools. But there were big efforts being made about how you can reach children. And as school systems, similar efforts were made because everybody was concerned that time was ticking and the thing called school was not operating. And so what would happen to children? All over the world, even within our own country, there were all kinds of people who were trying to create games, applications, and all kinds of things that could be sent to children from remote. Everybody looked at the resources they had and the abilities they had, and what is the best combination of these things that could be put together to serve the needs for today. And the more that we did, the more that we discovered we could do. Old phones came out of the cupboard, radios were dusted off. Suddenly we found that this thing called education could be done in many different ways. And the space between the school and the uh, home, which perhaps was a little bit distant and wide, became full of many different people trying many different things. And I think when we look back, one of the things that we'll see when we are able to let the dust settle is that everyone, starting from our grandmother to the last grandchild, from the first teacher to a very experienced teacher, everyone learned new ways of doing things. And so I would say that as we look ahead, and we have to look ahead, and our story has to go to a new, uh, a new chapter. At least for me, I can see some green new shoots beginning to sprout. You may call them shoots, new green shoots of new hope, because I think that as a society, as a national society, as a village community, we have all learned that there are new ways of doing things. What are these new ways of doing things? If you take a step back, and you look at the key pieces of what constitute education, we can see that absolutely the core elements of the who, the where, the when, the how, the what, and perhaps even the why have undergone some change. Now in many Indian languages, for example, in Hindi, we have a word called alpaviram. Alpaviram means a comma, usually. When you write, you use commas and you use full stops. And we all now know that this shock that hit us is not a full stop, it's like a comma. And in that period of a comma, we have had the time to really reimagine what this thing called education, especially for children, could be like. So let's look, if you imagine the picture that I drew for you as actually a real picture, let's imagine who is doing what. I think the who of education, clearly we can see, that in addition to the teacher who needs to be a key part of what we do, there are all kinds of other people who now feel quite competent, capable, and perhaps sometimes they've been pushed into this role and sometimes they've taken the role for themselves, whether it is the older sister or the neighborhood friend. I think everybody sees that they can do more than they were doing in terms of helping children learn. If you think about the where this can happen, it's clear that this business of learning is happening not just inside those four walls, but in the courtyard of your house, maybe on top of a tree. It can be happening anywhere really, wherever it's convenient. When lessons come through your father's phone and father only comes home late at night, 
then that's when you take what you, you have in his phone and try to do it. If messages come on your mother's little Nokia phone, then you take the phone from her when she's able to share it with you. So really, just like the who has really multiplied, the where and the when can also be done now in many, many different ways. And we all have experiences of doing that. If you think about the how, I think the how earlier was face to face. It was one on one or rather it was in groups of children who were dealing with adults. I think that how has also become a much more mixed situation with different ways in which people have been connecting. It is true that for some uh, children, there is many methods by which uh, lessons and learning opportunities are reaching them. Some are on online classes at all times and others get just a hundred and you know, whatever, 60 character SMS on their parents' phone. But it's clear that the old ways in which the only way you could learn was being in front of a teacher with a group of children sitting in rows and columns has certainly undergone some change. So the how has changed as well. And I would not be surprised if we are all doing a lot of rethinking on the what. What should we learn? How should it be learned? And when should it be learned? If you think about education as three broad streams, learning for school, for learning to go further and further in education, then that is one kind of learning. And I call it learning for school. You can think about learning for life. And that's the kind of thing that we are all using right now. When resources are limited, how do you make do? When somebody is ill in the family, but you're not able to take them to the nearest doctor or to the nearest hospital, then what do you do? When money has finished and yet you have to survive, what do you do? There are many, many, many things that I think we as adults and as children need to learn about learning for life. And then of course there is learning for work. So perhaps in this Alpaviram period, we are all in our own different ways thinking about all these different kinds of learnings that we need to be ready for. And also thinking that this individual academic excellence mode where we are checked off during tests or exams to certify that we've learned really also under needs to undergo quite a lot of change. So put together, I think, to me what it looks like is that the why we are doing all of this is already being rethought. And like a green new shoot, a green new shoot of new hope for education, we need to tend to this carefully. When schools open up again, which we hope we will do, we hope that the schools can open up in a much stronger way, much stronger way with the support of all these capabilities and resources that people in the community have shown, both from the air in terms of new ways of technology reaching us and also new ways from the ground. And therefore, I think that as we get ready to face the future, we have many things we need to do, but I'd like to leave you with three major pieces. One is we need to get ready to get back, get back not just into what we were doing before, but get back and pull with us the new things that we have learned. This is true for a child who will enter standard one. This will also be true for somebody who's going to sit for their 12th standard exams not very uh, far from now. The second is that we need to connect with each other. There has been in this big shock period, you know, ways in which we haven't met our friends, our teachers and many others in our life. So within school, we need time to connect back to each other and connect back with all the experiences that we've had. We need to give ourselves time to catch up, catch up on very basic things, as well as catch up on things that we feel we may have missed out on in the last year. And finally, putting it all together, I think we need to get ready for a massive leap forward. So I want to leave you with this idea and I'm so happy that I was asked to speak about the new hope because despite the difficulties that we've had in this last one year, I see some very, very promising green shoots of new hope. Thank you.